We have with us again today, after having done a pre-record, we have Dave McGowan with us, who's working on a very interesting and very, I should say, um, arousing uh, series called Inside the LC, The Strange But Mostly True Story of Laurel Canyon and the Birth of the Hippie Generation. Uh, we, we did a pre-record, as we said, he's on live now. A lot of you folks might want to ask questions and make some comments. We've got a ton of stuff that came through, emails uh, to that effect, and I think we'll start the show off with that if that's okay. So, Dave, thanks a lot for coming back, and uh, I would say uh, you got a live one here. Uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, <laughs> taking on a life of its own. This is actually, I think, the, the third interview I've done in the last uh, week or so, and i got two more uh, lined up. All of a sudden, I'm uh, I'm a very popular guy. <laughs> well... <laughs> Which paradoxically is 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 uh, slowing me down on finishing up this series now because I'm just getting inundated with emails and interview requests and and uh, it's kind of weird. I'm not I'm not used to being such a popular guy. <laughs> well, this too shall pass. <laughs> I'm used to working in obscurity, you know, and just uh, <laughs> not having anybody really, not too many people other than my my devoted followers, my small. Uh, cult of devoted followers who uh pay att- pay much attention to what I have to say so it's uh it's kind of weird to uh to be to have this sudden popularity <laughs> well you know well then good for you in a sense because obviously when you put something out like that uh no matter how people feel i guess about politics Dave no matter how they feel about flight ninety three blah 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 um everybody in my cohort, which you were probably a little bit just beyond. I mean, like I said, I got, like, what, nine years on you. But, I mean, you understand what that was all about. Anyway, a lot of those folks actually do get it. Uh, I guess we've lived long enough that we we realize we've been lied to. I I think that happens with age. I think this has been happening for some time. The older folks always said stuff to the younger folks, and I will admit I listened to it and looked at them and go, yeah, okay, Grandpa, take a hike. He was right. (laughs) I was wrong. (laughs) But um, along with music, though, this is a very special thing. Um, I, you know, growing up inside of it, I thought this was a very organic thing, and we're going to get into that definition of it. I'm going to ask you for your definition of it, because some of the questions that came in wanted to know about whether or not this whole thing was rigged, or whether partly it was rigged, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, let me, uh, if you want to uh, give us any comments with regard to that, by all means, uh, because if you don't, or after you do, I'd like to uh, pass some comments and questions by you. Well, I certainly grew up believing that it was organic. Um, you know, like I, I think I mentioned, it's, it's getting hard for me to remember what I've what I've covered in these various forums now. Because, uh, yeah, but I, I think I think we talked before about uh, that I was born in 1960 and actually sort of uh, came of age in the uh, the mid mid late 70s. But I always considered myself a, a child of the 60s, and that that was the music that I listened to, and, and the fashions that I wore, and you know, I mean, I was I was uh, wildly up with my peers when I went to uh, college because uh, it was like I started college in uh, well, I went to junior college, and I, I transferred to UCLA, I think, in like 1980 or 1981, which was the the dawn of the Reagan uh, era. And uh, the whole campus was, like, filled with all these preppies, you know, wearing Izod Lacoste shirts and topside. And, mm-hmm. I mean, it was like the official uniform. And here's this uh, here's this 60s throwback wandering the campus, you know, and bare feet and long hair. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I, I totally bought into it, uh, you know, pretty much my entire life up until maybe, like, you know, ten years ago, I started having my doubts, and you know, started reading things like um, uh, Martin Lee's Acid Dreams, and uh, you know, various other works that kind of called into question, you know, just how much of it was organic. But I, I always believe that at least the, the the music, the soundtrack of the '60s, was real and organic. And uh, unfortunately, in the last year, year and a half, I've, I've even begun to seriously question that, and that's uh, sort of what brought about this, this series, um, which I began with a quote from uh, Stephen Stillman for what it's worth, there's something happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear. And I have to say that after close to a year and a half now of digging through this, it's it's still not... <laughs> 
it still ain't exactly clear, but I'm hoping that by the time I, I complete this journey, it will have all uh, come into some kind of a focus. All right. Fair enough, and, and let me run by you. This is a comment, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with it or, or not. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, this is what the folks are thinking, and let me run this by you. Okay. That um, you guys started talking about a lot of uh, these musicians from the 60s uh, that were children of people in the military. It was real cool that you mentioned Jim Morrison before his name was even brought up. I said to myself out loud, yeah, such musicians like Jim Morrison. And you guys mentioned his name. However, I had no clue that Jim Morrison's father was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. That was real news to me. If this is true, then Morrison obviously knew what really happened there leading to the Vietnam War. And I'll stop right there. I don't really think he might have. But Dave, do you have any uh, information to the fact that he did? And if so, does that make a difference? I no, I do not have any specific information that he knew. I, I mean, he he knew obviously that his dad was uh, deployed in that arena. I mean, he basically saw him off. I, got, I have a picture of him on the on the uh, bridge on the bridge the ship yeah. with his father in January of 1964. Not long before uh, he shipped off to go over to that part of the world, the, the incident occurred in August of 64. So I mean, it was just literally just months before. Uh, the ship set sail so he knew his father was there he knew that his father was the commanding officer of the fleet that was there so I mean you know I, I suppose he could have uh, deduced that, that his dad was directly involved but uh, I, don't, I don't have any specific information that, that uh, okay. well no I mean um, and like I said I can understand uh, the individual running with that and he might in fact be true so let me finish up with his next paragraph he said more reason to prove that he was definitely murdered. All right, now hold that for a second. He probably spoke too much. Imagine being someone working in intelligence and knowing that there was a real famous musician out there in the world whose father was there at the Gulf of Tonkin. Obviously, this man's son would know the truth of what really happened, and his popularity would obviously pose a threat to national security. If this is true about Morrison, then it is final. He was definitely murdered. That's just to name a few, of course, with the, with the people are talking about. Um, but again... We really can't say. Well, I mean, you tell me. Was Morrison whacked, or did he do himself? Uh, well, to, in, to my mind, there's two possibilities. If he was, and if he did indeed die, when when uh, we're told he did, and and bearing in mind that that there was never any body produced, there was no autopsy, there was no service, they didn't even announce his death until he was allegedly in the ground. Uh, he was buried within four days supposedly despite the fact that he was a you know a US national and a very famous one uh they 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 cleared all the hurdles somehow and got him uh, got got everything done and and uh, his body in the ground within 4 days before it was even announced that he was dead so by the time they they had announced that uh that he was gone uh it was basically but there's nothing to see here you know don't <laughs> Don't bother coming around because uh, he's already buried. There's no, you know, I mean, nobody ever saw the body. There was no autopsy there, no service held. So the first question is, did he even die in Paris, uh, which is an open question in my mind. But if he did, if he did in fact die over there, then I would say that uh, there's a very, very, very high chance that he was murdered, yeah. Um, also, you have to understand something as we go into this season, especially in Florida, which we've not had to worry too much about, but as dry as we've been, it is uh, now the hurricane season. However, I just want to say to you folks on the East Coast, um, there may be some kind of disruption due to uh, storms on the East Coast. This is something that we might have to live with uh, if uh, those things happen to visit us in Florida on Wednesday. So if you've got uh, some issues that you might think are um, contributed to uh uh, the weather they in fact are uh, anybody else who's trying to listen to the show uh, you can um, if you're having a problem go ahead and refresh and try to click in that way and tell me how you make out um, yeah we really don't know about Morrison but of course this isn't just uh, an isolated case but we'll get back to that a little bit later yeah. what I like Mor Morrison had also he, he had told a number of interviewers he had talked about sort of reinventing himself he said he could see himself uh uh, having a radical career change and sort of transforming into the same person. I mean, the guy is just, uh, 
Yeah, he was a bit of a changeling, and and he had talked about about uh, about you know basically just sort of uh, reemerging as a as a completely different individual, uh, completely different profession, and and everything else. So, I think there's there's a lot of open questions about whether Jim Morrison really died over there in Paris. All right, well, we also have a caller, um, and uh, let's take them now, Dave. Uh, hello, caller. You're on. Nope. Oh. No. <laughs> I got a message from the producer saying prank call, they are gone. That's okay. Let me just say this now, folks. If you do want to call in, you can do so on triple triple three nine zero zero nine. And when you call in, you're not going to get somebody who's going to hook you in as a screener. But if you call and then you start to hear the show, you are in and we will get to you. So you're not going to hear anybody say anything to you. You hear the show and you call in, you're there. So uh, be that as it may. Also, let me just say this also, that... Um, you can also send emails to Visigoth at Hotmail.com, Visigoth at Verizon.net. You can use MSN IM, the messenger, and that would be Visigoth. And, uh, again, we're hearing from people that things are a little crazy, but this is summertime. Well, you know, for the most part, summertime in a lot of places in America, and certainly that is the case uh, here in Florida. So, uh, you know, things will happen with the weather. If you get bounced out, uh, it's probably due to that. Come back in if you can. If you're having a hard time listening to the conversation, um, then go ahead and uh, refresh. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm, that's that's what I'm getting for the most part here. So, Dave, I have to do a little bit of maintenance here because everything's coming through um, on my screen. But go on to um, a second item, if you would. Uh, and this is from a listener from over in Paris. Um, let's see. Okay, here's a, a couple of questions that being posed. Dave mentioned that only two years ago he was completely unaware of Laurel Canyon. Be interesting to know what tipped him off in that direction, his path to discovery, so to say. What do you think? Uh, it was actually a book that my eldest daughter got for me uh, for Christmas. Uh, not this, not this uh, past Christmas, but the one before. Uh, a book called Laurel Canyon, written by a guy named Michael Walker. It was. Uh, fairly newly released at the time and uh it covers the the Laurel Canyon scene it kind of introduced me to the fact that this this uh this sort of uh, remote isolated neighborhood in LA had had uh had had been home to all these these this was just amazing array of musicians and there was a lot of little clues a lot of little little uh warning bells that went off in my head as I was reading this, sort of reading between the lines, and so ever since then, I've I've been reading everything that I can get my hands on about that, that era, uh, just every book and magazine article and web post and everything else that, that, uh, that I can get my hands on, ferreting out all the little, the little sordid details that are, you know, sort of hidden in, in the, the mainstream accounts of that era. But that had to be something also, Dave, that you weren't really, you know, you didn't need all that kind of priming. I mean, it was kind of probably there anyway, and this gave you a bit of a, what, of a, a little bit of a trigger to go do it? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 well, the thing that, the, that just instantly drew me to the story and the, that was so fascinating to me is that it was it's so close to home, you know I mean? Oh, that's right, yeah. So close to me, and it's somewhere that I can actually go and, and visit, I mean, you know, I can jump in my car and in, in 15, 20 minutes be be at these places. You know, seeing them for real, how they mm -hmm. how they look today, and sort of getting a a feel and a vibe for the place. So I was just just instantly drawn to the story by by you know a number of factors. Um, and one one of the key ones of which is that it just it happened right in my backyard here, and I didn't even know about it. That's you know. <laughs> That's the way <laughs> things go. Yeah, I, I was kind of offended by that in a way that, you know, I've been doing, I've been researching this, I've lived here all my life and I've been researching this stuff for a, a good number of years and yet, uh, and yet and they, they pulled the wool over my eyes on something that happened right behind my back, you know, so that's... Uh, how dare they? I know. Uh, yeah, exactly, how dare they? But it's always in your own neighborhood, you don't know what the heck is going on. Yeah. All right, we're going to go on with um, uh, some questions and comments from... Uh, uh, Erky out in uh, uh, Paris. I'd like to hear both of your views on the relationship between the organic and inorganic. In other words, something was very real and authentic during the 60s, organic, and something was contrived, inorganic. 
how did one influence the other and to what level? I'll stop right there. There's a third part to this, but um, you tell me what your take is because I came to this of late also as to what might have been, you know, rigged. What do you think about what really truly was an evolution, if you would, or a revolution, and what might have been also either injected into it or, you know, something other that turned it down a side street? Um, I, you know, any more and more, I'm of an opinion that that what we think of as the '60s counterculture, which is the the whole hippie flower child, uh, you know, freak, whatever whatever term you want to apply to it, movement. I think I, I'm I'm really leaning heavily towards believing that 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 entire thing was a fraud, every aspect of it from from beginning to end, and that there was a very real. A whole a whole series of very real movements that were budding in the 1960s and the in the early 60s a budding anti-war movement a budding uh, civil rights movement a budding um, uh, women's rights movement uh, a budding black power movement uh, you know through the Panthers and whatnot and I th- I think most of those most if not all of those were were, were very legitimate and and uh, the, this whole uh, sort of hippie thing just kind of moved in. And overshadowed over that all of that, and sort of became identified in people's minds with what the '60s were all about. And uh, so I, I think that whole aspect of it was was a sham. What <laughs> so, <laughs> that makes any sense? Well, well you make a good point um, when you went back, and I think you quoted. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, Abby Hoffman or whatever, saying, you know, the anti-war protesters. Um, were protesting the war in Vietnam before the hippie generation or the flower power children came on the scene. Now, that is not necessarily exclusive of what you said, so can we assume also that the real hardcore political uh, elements were against the war and then all of a sudden the love, the love children come through and either kind of help or hinder what's going on? Uh, what's your take on that as far as what your research uh, uh, revealed? Yeah, I mean, basically, the way the way that I understand it is that there there was a uh, an anti-war movement underway, uh, largely on uh, college campuses, you know, with the professors and their students and whatnot, and you know, with respectable people. You know. <laughs> and, and then the hippies kind of came in, and all of a sudden, all the focus was on them, and they became identified as sort of the protest movement, and. Uh, I think that was a very calculated move because it's a lot easier to discredit and marginalize and uh, you know, a, a group of you know these these long-haired, uh, strangely dressed uh, you know hippies with with their peace signs and their their peculiar music and you know I mean it was just they were so foreign to you know to mainstream America uh, I mean they just look like you know people from from another world or something and and that made it much easier to marginalize uh, you know what the uh, anti-war movement that developed because all the focus was on them the media presented them as the face of the anti-war movement the uh, you know the whole hippie generation but they weren't I mean or at least they weren't the ones that Originally got the ball rolling, and you know would have would have kept it rolling, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. And, and you know, I mean, everybody always says that the, 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 the hippies stopped the war, the '60s counterculture stopped the war, and yada yada. But they didn't. Yeah. It, it carried on for an entire decade after the, the hippies came along. It didn't end for an entire decade after you know almost what sixty thousand, close to sixty thousand Americans had been shipped home in pine boxes, you know. And they didn't stop. I I, I think they very much. Uh, contributed to the extension of the war by by diluting and taking a lot of the wind out of the sails of what would have been a very strong anti-war movement if they hadn't have uh, appeared on the scene. Um, I'm, I'm going to reserve a comment, but I want to go to the last uh, uh, component of this email. Um, the individual writes, the idea that Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison where intelligence agents is absurd, at least to me. The idea that intelligence agents enter their lives is not. How do both of you see the interaction? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I agree that the idea that intelligence uh, operatives enter their lives is not absurd. absurd. 
but you know, I mean, these people frequently kill their own. You know, I mean, just because somebody is 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 gets whacked, it doesn't mean that they were one of the good guys. You know, <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, I haven't really gotten into Jimi Hendrix too much at all. I, I, all I mentioned was, the, you know, really the unusual circumstances of his death. Uh, he was not a huge part of the, the Laurel Canyon scene. He identified with uh, San Francisco, although he did spend time in Laurel Canyon, and, and according to some reports, he had to maintain a home there for a while. But I haven't really focused that much on him. Um, Jim Morrison, I think, is much much more suspect than uh, than Jimi Hendrix as far as uh, yeah whether whether he was a covert agent or not. Um, I I'll have some more uh, information for you that I want to run by it, but I I want to at least vent uh, what came to us through the listeners because obviously you know that's why we do the show. So let's do this. Now I don't know if you want to go here, but I do want to go here. And, um, you know, however you want to deal with it, that's fine. Uh, I just think it needs airing. We do a lot of things on symbology, Dave, um, and the bigger picture about, you know, I guess spiritual forces, if you will. Uh, I know that's kind of open-ended, but I'm going to just throw this out at you. Uh, somebody wrote who, who, was, um, who was in Freemasonry, and he said, when I took my third uh, degree in Masonry, we went through the story of Hiram, Hiram Abiff and the Three Unworthy Workers, and he goes on and on and on, but um, uh, you know I don't want to go through the. Whole, I mean, not that it's, it's it's tedious whatsoever, but I want to get down to the kernel of what he was talking about, and that is in masonry, the laurel branch, L A U R E L, the laurel, the bush has a has a significant meaning in Freemasonry. Now let me ask you this: I don't know if you've come upon it. I don't know if you will come upon it, or if you want to completely, I guess, uh, dispense with it, but. Are we looking at a little something going on in Laurel Canyon that might have been dealing with a quasi-secret society? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I I haven't really looked at it from that angle. I, I'm not familiar at all with the uh, what you were talking the about. The symbology of Laurel, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's not a an, uh, that's not that has not come up in in any regard in what I've read so far. So I haven't not looked at it at all from that angle. All right, I mean that. I mean, I'm wondering if that will come up, but also what I'm wondering is, uh, as you go deeper into the history of Laurel Cannon, which you did in part two to a certain extent, when you get back to Gene Harlow and Paul Byrne and such, I'm wondering if it even goes back to that. Uh, who knows if you can uncover that? I don't know that you want to do that or if it'll pop up all by itself, but I'm wondering if inlaid in, in the history of Laurel Canyon, if there wasn't a little something there that, that had a wink and a nod. Uh, it's quite possible. I mean, you, you, I never know what's going to come up in this story, to be honest with you. I know. Last time I talked to you, you asked me about, uh, John Denver. I, are, are, are you the one? I think you're the yeah, one. Yeah, we talked about, um, yeah, Dusseldorf yeah. and, uh. Yeah, and, and, and I said, yeah, I haven't really looked at that because he's, he's not a part of, you know, he hasn't, he hasn't come up in this story at all. Well, no sooner did I see <laughs> it, the very next day he came up in the story, and sure enough, he he moved to LA in uh, 1964, and he actually joined a band uh, that uh, uh, Roger McGuinn, I believe it was, of the Birds had been in. Same band as as one of the Birds, and uh, turns out he was a, he was he was present. Uh, supposedly, according to some reports, he was present at the. Uh, the infamous riot on the Sunset Strip, and I think it was November of 1966. Uh, and yeah, so he actually <laughs> come to find out. No sooner had I told you that he wasn't a part of it than I came to find out that he was a part of it. And and you were right. He's a son of a career uh, Air Force officer, I believe it was. And like a lot of other people in the stories, there's a lot of open questions about his death. Uh, so yeah, he fits right. In. Well, <laughs> he fits right in with the rest of these. Same family background, same mysterious past. Same, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's amazing how many people are are rolled up into this story. People you wouldn't even, you know, Glenn Campbell was very much a part of the scene, and you know, I mean, these people that you wouldn't even. 
<laughs> you know, I know, I know. It's, just, it's, it's just weird. Yeah, it's, it's just it, the story just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I, I'm I, I don't even know what to do with it at this point. You know, there's just so many tentacles pointing out in so many directions. It's like which, you know, which leads do I follow, and and you know, and how far do I follow them? Because then they branch off into it, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Well, in fairness to you, if I remember correctly, uh, you did not dispense with the fact that uh, John Denver might have been part of it, but you said, you know, mm, good point, and we left it at that, and lo and behold, you know, days after we spoke, you find out that, in fact, he was involved in the LC as well. And we've got some more um, um, emails coming in. I want to put this in a, in, a, in a kind of an order where we can, I don't know, I guess, do it in a way where it isn't uh, hopscotch, but... And, uh, Karen, um, I've got your email, and I definitely want to get to it because if you want to know about Manson, I'm going to hold that off if we can. Uh, but we definitely want to address it. Also, Dave, we got this. Um, we, uh, we got it from Larry. He said, I just finished listening to the show on Laurel Canyon in the 60s today, and it blew my mind. Well, gee, that's where it all came from. <laughs> um, I had never given much thought to rock stars and their heritage of military intelligence connections. I knew about Morrison, but chalked it off to rebelling against his father that he, you know, lied about his parents being dead since he was ashamed of his father being a high-ranking military officer. Today, when all these icons of the 60s rock counter, uh, counterculture turn out to have military intelligence connections, then Dave's question was very appropriate. My question here, I guess, is this. What do you suppose the odds, odds are that all of that just came purely together by chance? Uh, I, I think the odds are astronomical, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't even gotten into it yet. I'm going to in a future installment, but I can give you a sneak preview. And that is the another aspect of the story is the Hollywood Young Turks, what were known as the Young Turks angle, because they were very much a, a part, the young Hollywood stars who were also very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. Peter what, Fonda, what year was that is when, the, when the Young Turks uh, had their uh, bones? Uh, mid like from 1965 on, uh, it was you know P- uh, Peter Fonda, Bruce Dern, uh, Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty. Um, uh, Jane Fonda, well, she wasn't a young Turk. I guess she would be a Turkette or somebody. <laughs> okay. You know, there's this whole group of people that, that also can. And Peter Fonda had a place there. Dennis Hopper did. Uh, you know, uh, Sal Minio lived right at the mouth of the canyon. So that this whole little clique of, of young Hollywood actors who were making the, the, the scene on the Sunset Strip Clubs and were living in Laurel Canyon and, and making movies in Laurel Canyon. I don't know if we talked about that last time, uh, the movie, the, the Monkeys movie. Oh, Head, yeah, and, when Nicholson's in there, yep. Yeah, and, and The Trip and Easy Rider. Those movies all sort of came out of Laurel Canyon. They were They were very much part of the scene, and I've been looking into their past, and some of them have even more... More troubling uh, connections than the than the uh, the rock stars that they were hanging out with. I'll give one example: Bruce Dern, uh, oh, yeah. he, he co-starred with Fonda in the trip, and you know he was very much a part of that scene. And uh, his uh, uncle on his mother's side, his mother was uh, Jean McLeish. His uncle was Archibald McLeish, who was Skull and Bones, class of 1915, the year before Prescott Bush, who was class of 1916. And uh, his um, grandfather on his dad's side was a former Secretary of War, which was what we call the Secretary of Defense. Defense now, yep. Slightly more honest times. (laughs) (laughs) And his godparents were uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and... um, uh, Adelaide Stevenson, the guy who twice lost to uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower, yeah. So I mean, his family—he—he he comes directly from this whole stew of you know skull and bones and and Department of Defense and I mean, just, so and, and that's true also uh, of several of the others. So it it was not just the musicians who had gathered in the canyon who were the offspring of the military intelligence comp. It was all the uh, Young Hollywood actors that they were hanging out with as well. So I mean, you know, at some point you got to say how how many coincidences does it take to make a conspiracy? You know, and and 
for me, I think I, I, we passed the threshold a long time ago on this story, you know. So that would be, I guess, my answer. To, <laughs> yeah, it's it's way too much for me to accept as, as all coincidental. Um, I'm just going to enter this now because uh, this is about you, not about me. Uh, although I was there, and you know. <clears throat> anyway, I mean, I, you know, I saw it all. I, I went through a, a, a bunch of stages. Um, but the one thing that um, I now question when I look back, and we, we talk about it now, is that um, the whole introduction also of Ellis, I think, is very, very interesting. Um, uh, Ken Kesey, who I revered as a writer, you know, he's the author of um, Sometimes a Great Notion and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <clears throat> of course, he is the subject, Tom Wolfe's, uh, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, but when they had acid, and it was not against the law because nobody knew they had it, although, of course, it is suspected that the Army intelligence created it. And, of course, they you know, they, they had the uh, the concerts out on the coast where the Warlocks played, who later became um, the Grateful Dead. Yeah, nice and, name, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And then, of course, uh, the famous trip on the bus with uh, Neil Cassidy driving as they go across the coast uh, and they uh, eventually end on the east coast and they were talking to uh, Leary and then came back but you know the one thing uh, and then I want to go into it now so I'll just leave it there but I mean if we can go to that later on about the whole introduction to LSD that's interesting too but let me go to that oh yeah and, and the fact that it it remained legal for as long as it did during that time you know when so there was supposedly all this harassment and everything going on and yet LSD remained perfectly legal you know? <laughs> yeah I mean the cops couldn't arrest you because there was no law against it you couldn't smoke a joint but you could drop acid you know? <laughs> I mean, well, well, you get your ass bust if you're smoking a joint but if you're doing acid they just let you alone yeah I mean that's that yeah. seems very odd doesn't it in retrospect yeah. that they wouldn't have immediately clamped down on that I mean yeah, and it, it, that's why I'm saying, but uh, I think uh, you're going to come to that also at another time. But I, you know, just to, to kind of whet the appetites of people, that's the one thing that I think really bothered me, how straight up Kesey was. But and of course, because he Kesey, I worked on a psych ward, uh, which gave him the fodder for the book uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yes, yes. He also studied at Stanford with his the Stanford Research Institute, and I can't hook them both up, but it's kind of interesting as well. Um, but that for another day. Now, we got a comment. It said, I am fascinated regarding the links between these people. Someone knew someone who worked with someone else, and in the end, there are often bad endings to people, mysterious deaths and such. The fact that so much of the music was so good, agreed, so brilliant in many cases, agreed, was the music itself generally contrived as some part of some, part of some plan, in quotes, to change society. I would love to hear more about the parents or other family members, even in some cases the celebrity themselves, being involved in intelligence. What has been the overall goal, goal and uh, has it been met? Uh, and lastly, was Manson suspect as well as um, strange intelligence connections? All right, that's a lot of stuff and probably not all for this moment. But let's do this. First of all, I thought the music was excellent. I think it was. I, I, I firmly believe it. I, I still have the records in my collection. I mean, I, uh, yeah, it's, it was, uh, it, it, I mean, for, for a very long time after that, there wasn't anything worth listening to on the music. I mean, the music of the 70s and 80s was pretty much wretched, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the music was, was, was very good and, and it, it stood the test of time. Um, to what degree it was contrived, I, I couldn't really tell you, but, uh, you know, I would definitely agree that the, that the music was, uh, it, 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 it is definitely stood up to the test of time, in my opinion. And, and mine too, and again, but you know what this goes back to. And Dave, I don't want to spend any time on this. If sometime in the future you want to do something, that's fine, because we can't open this oyster right here. But I mean, we we have treated the um, issue whether or not the Beatles were handled by a composer of some note who uh, has gone like below the uh, you know radar screen. And that would be Theodore Adorno, and um, whether or not they got together in England because Adorno uh, supposedly uh, fleed Germany prior to World War II, and John Coleman and his conspirators uh, hierarchy and some others uh, put the Beatles with Adorno together so that they were trying to get something done. Now, that's like for another time. Just leave that where it is. But the fact that there is some kind of suggestion that 
rock and roll was being handled in some uh, some fashion. But like again, not for another time. Uh. Um, but moving on to another question, uh, and, and let me get back to this again. Okay, what about uh, if we can? Um, as far as you've gone with this, let's just kind of flip over because there's a couple of people that want to know how much Manson had a hand in what was taking place in that particular era. Well, he was he was very much a part of the scene. Uh, I mean, virtually, virtually all of the the big name musicians that came out of there in that era knew him. Uh, most of them don't like to admit it, but uh, you know some of them have. Uh, one of the guys from Canned Heat admitted that, that they used to party with the, the Manson family. You know, he auditioned for Neil Young. He auditioned for. Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead. He uh, auditioned for Dennis Wilson. He was recorded by Dennis Wilson. He was recorded by Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son, who was a uh, producer of the <coughs> the Birds and various other bands. And, I mean, he hung out at. He was known to hang out at Moss's house. He's been reported to have been at uh, John Phillips' house. Some of his followers. Reportedly lived at the log cabin that uh, Frank Zappa was the ringmaster at, you know, and late in 1968, according to Ed Sanders' book, uh, The Family. Uh, I mean, he was he was all over the place. His fingerprints are all over that whole music scene. Um, you know, I mean, you, you find references to him constantly throughout. He, he or or one of his followers, particularly. Uh, Bobby Bozelay. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. We were discussing that earlier, but uh, <laughs> uh, his beautiful son, by the way, um, he was very much a part of the scene as well. He actually lived in Laurel Canyon for a while and was the original rhythm guitarist for mm -hmm. the band that became Love when they were known as the Grassroots. Oh, yeah. And uh, Tex Watson, who who was the the leader of the expedition that went to the uh, Yellow Drive House, he lived uh, in Laurel Canyon on Wonderland Avenue. And yeah, I mean they're just they're just everywhere. They're they're all over the story. You can't. It, it's unavoidable. You just you just keep bumping into one, one or more members of the Manson family uh, around every turn, pretty much. It is interesting, though, because it, it almost seemed, though, he was at least dignified to some extent as having a little talent. I don't think, I mean, from what I can remember, and this is a long time ago, I mean, the Wilsons from the Beach Boys weren't necessarily blowing him off. I'm just sure that, you know, when he came into your uh, living room, it was, he was kind of scary. You know? <laughs> uh, I would imagine, except that he, he always brought a huge gaggle of women with him, you know, and, you know, for the, from the descriptions uh, that I've read, I mean, he just he just basically brought this troop of, of young girls with him that would just pretty much do and and service anyone that, that you know Manson wanted to get on the good side of. So you know. All right. So in other words, he had a way of uh, he had a calling card, didn't he? He had a calling card, yeah, a calling card that was very attractive to Dennis Wilson and his two uh, sidekicks, Terry Melcher and Greg Jacobson, uh, which was, yeah, these just young, attractive, adoring women who would uh, cater to their every whim. All right, I just want to let people know, too, we've been talking with Dave McGowan. Um, the website, Dave, is davesweb.cnchost.com. But, you know, it always, I mean, the link always goes up. Uh, your link always goes up with the audio. Not a big deal. But if you're listening right now, if you want to do that, you go to davesweb.cnchost.com. You can pick up all the newsletters that are right there at the top. The, the uh, website's also known as the Center for an Informed. For what? An Informed what? America. America, okay. That's when my printer stopped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classy, isn't it? All right, no problem with that. Um <clears throat> Yeah, there's a couple, uh, I should have parts five and six up in the next, uh, few days, hopefully. They're near, they're nearing completion, so. Well, I don't think anybody's in a hurry as long as, you know, it, it comes out and it comes out right. I mean. Uh, some of my readers are. I keep getting emails. What happened? You were putting them out, you know, every, and now all of a sudden, I'm like, just give me a chance. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got to reboot. I got a lot of material to dig through and organize and, you know. 
I want to make sure I get it right. I mean, there's so much there's so much bad information in all the mainstream accounts. I mean, you you read something in one book, and the next day you read a, a different version in another book that completely contradicts the the first version that you read. And I mean, trying trying to sort out the truth from the Hollywood mythology and and legend making is uh, is <laughs> I want to make sure I get it as accurate as possible. You know, I say I don't want to waste a whole bunch of minutes. We got something else from two people, three people that kind of resonate with the same question. I'm going to throw that to you. And I don't know. You know, I don't know we're going to have this time. But I mean, that's why I say the series goes on. And as long as you're okay at your convenience, we can go on and and you know delve into some of these things. But yeah. um, you know, I mean, when I would, you know, when all this stuff was going on, I'm like 17 years old. But I'm following it through the Daily News. You know, when I lived in the New York area. And you look at this stuff, and, you know, to this day, you know, I try to think back as to how I just, like, assimilated all this stuff, or I, or maybe I just just offed it, because it was so bizarre. And, and of course, the Vietnam thing was going on. I, I really do believe that all of us just took, took this stuff in, we threw it away, and we went on with our lives, because there's no world. We were going to get deep into this and not get brain damage. So... You know, I, I'm just amazed at all that passed through us at that time. As much as people today, you know, yak about martial law and police state, then all might be happening. But, you know, we really have to take a look. I don't know how you feel about this, but, I mean, I look back to 70 to 75, and I'm like, I don't even know how we get through this. <laughs> I mean, do you, you, I mean that, if you want to crack in on that, by all means, but, I mean, it can get a lot stranger. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very strange world we live in. Uh, as I, yeah, the older I get, the more I realize that, and the, the deeper you dig down these rabbit holes, you more, the more you realize that it uh, definitely is a very strange. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know that anything. There's very little that seems that that can shock me anymore. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the weird thing about the, the whole hippie movement is that it just seemed to happen so fast, you know, and I mean, how, how does that happen that, you know, I mean, it, it had to start somewhere, you know, I mean, how, how do all these kids just all of a sudden end up adopting this, this completely different lifestyle that, you know, I mean, different hairstyles, different clothing styles, different music, and I mean, how did that, how did that just, just happened so quickly that the, the all these kids just just all of a sudden woke up one day with long hair and and bad clothes, you know. <laughs> but Dave, the thing is, we, that happened without VHS. I mean, uh, whatever it is, the hell is it called? Uh, you know, I don't know. What's all the rock and roll things on? You know, on the on the uh, MTV. Okay, uh, this happened without MTV, without BET, and all these videos. This happened without wall to wall. 24-7 TV. This happened without that. That's the thing I think is most interesting is because they didn't have that medium to get to everybody all the time where the mom and dad were, were watching what you were watching on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we weren't, we weren't, uh, we definitely weren't all tied in as much to this, yeah, to, uh, yeah. to where we're all, the, the entire country, every every remote corner of the country is now fed the same daily diet of of crap, you know, from our news and entertainment media and and through the internet and whatnot. And yet, it still just sprung up. I mean, just it just just out of nowhere, all of a sudden, we had this this whole what 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 very quickly became the the, the largest countercultural movement in uh, in American history. Just sort of. Out of nowhere, almost, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it is very odd that 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 that, that it that it just that it happened like that, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> why, you know, why why this sort of this such a drastic countercultural movement, you know? I mean, what, what you know, where, where everything about them was sort of foreign to small town, you know, mainstream America. I mean, everything their their look, their their music, their attitude, and, you know, I mean. Yeah, it's 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 odd. It's very odd in retrospect. That, that yeah, uh, and, and let's hopefully uh, revisit that in time to come. We got a couple of comments. One from Carpet Max said, "If he's got kids, married and bored and turned collectivist." Well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Also, we got another comment. Doesn't Shirley McLean have nebulous uh, family, military origins, or connections? 
Uh, Shooter McLean is uh, Warren Beatty's brother, obviously, That's right. and he was he was again one of the the young Turks uh, that hung out with that crowd. His father was supposedly a like a psychiatrist, psychologist, or a psychology professor, or something like that. But I mean, he he moved around in uh, in an unusual way. I think he was like born in like. Uh, Alexandria, Virginia, I think. And what a surprise! They, yeah, and then they moved to Norfolk, Virginia. You know, the 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 largest naval base in the world. And then they, after that, they moved to I think Arlington, Virginia, like the home of the Pentagon. And so, you know, I mean, his whole early life was spent hopping around between these little, you know, military intelligence suburbs of of Washington D.C. So. Mm-hmm. Even though you know his father, his father didn't officially work for for the military, but you know you got to sort of a lot of times you got to kind of read between, between the lines. lines. Yeah. One of the things that surprised me really about this story is that so many of these people's military intelligence connections are right out there up front because usually you do have to read between the lines. I mean, CIA and all its affiliated. Uh, spy organizations, they're secret organ, you know, they operate in secrecy, that's by definition, so they don't advertise, you know, their membership. So, you know, usually you have to read between the lines and, and look, you know, where did this person grow up, or, you know, what, you know, what, what, where did the family move around to, and what circles did they, you know, travel and whatnot, but, you know, so Warren Beatty's kind of one of those cases where, and Shirley McLean also, obviously, because she's his uh, sister, um, it's one of those where you kind of have to read between the lines, but, you know, the, the amazing thing to me is is that, is that so much of this story, you don't have to read between the lines, and if there's that many people there that, that have open military and intelligence connections, then how many of the other ones had hidden, you know, military and intelligence connections? Um, I tell you what, you know, we got two heavy duty questions. I'm going to ask you to just give, if you could, a, um, a cursory answer to them both. We can visit this later on, because I think you're, you're going to, you know, you're going to come upon this if you haven't already. But we, you know, we'll revisit this. One message was uh, they had uh, mind control subliminal psychic messages put on records. Uh, Preston Nichols says this. Uh, he participated in this at Montauk. All right, that's that's one statement. Um, is there a possibility, whether it was um, backmasked or whatever, that there were certain things in there? I don't know. I mean, are we looking at something that was triggering to uh, a generation that might have been medicated to some extent? It's possible. I have not really looked in any great depth at that uh, aspect at all. I, I remember when I was a kid, the big backward masking controversy when I was I don't know, probably in my young teens or something. I remember there was a big thing about it, uh, you know, uh, in Led Zeppelin's records. I, I actually I can remember me and my friends spinning, a, trying to spin a Led Zeppelin, <laughs> you know, old thirty three and a third uh, yeah. final record backwards on a Make it talk to see if we could hear, you know, and a Beatles one too to see if we could hear uh, Paul's dead or whatever the hell was supposed. to <laughs> I know, I know. I remember doing it, yeah, but I, you know, as an adult and, you know, as as a researcher, I have not really, uh, no, I haven't really looked into that aspect of it. All right. Um, and that, that might come in time. And also, I do find it interesting, though, that they would plant that stuff in there, but that might have been a really great marketing scheme later on to get everybody to buy back albums. We have to, We can't overlook the fact that that was a really good marketing gimmick. Yeah, I remember Stairway to Heaven had supposedly had that. I can't remember. You, my sweet Satan. Yeah. Is that what it was? I, mean, I don't. I remember playing. The <laughs> and yeah, I can't hear it. and uh, Revolution Number no. Nine or something was yep. supposed to say. <laughs> I buried Paul. Paul is dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, we checked into it. I remember checking into it. I don't remember if we if we heard anything or not. It probably depended on our chemical balance at the time. The thing is, some of us never checked out. <laughs> okay, we got it. We got another good one for you here. This will only take about three hours to discuss. Uh, I, I love it. I wish these people would call in, but they don't. Anyway, I'm okay. Whether they're shy or they're at work, it's fine. But I tell you, this is a good one. Are right, either of you familiar with the lore that early in the Third Reich, German scientists experimented with Nepalese and other indigenous shamanistic chants, combining them with repetitive percussive patterns? 
in a quest to develop early NLP, which would be neuro linguistic programming, and brainwashing techniques. It was suspected that they created proto rock and rock and roll music before being ordered to shelve their findings. Might their research and results have been British war booty for Tavistock to perfect? Actually, Dave, that, that makes a lot of sense if, if you've come across some of the information that I've come across, or, you know, the listeners have. But, you know, this is what I was saying to you about whether or not it was true about Adorno and the Beatles. Had they crafted music along, you know, the lines of trying to influence uh, young people? And I would, I would have to say this. Right now, with the, with the longevity that hip hop has had, along with a rap, I mean, I got to think that there's something in there. So I'll, I won't say anything more. You know where I'm going with that. Do you want to address whether or not you know they built in some things that that deal with you know alpha beta uh, states of the brain? I I couldn't really speak to that. I'm not familiar with the specific line of research that she. Uh that the, the, you're uh, or he or she or whatever yeah you whatever was referencing there you know I mean I know that 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 the, the CIA and probably British intelligence did you know uh, from what I understand get a hold of all of the uh, secure all of the the records of all of the experiments that were conduct uh, you know conducted on uh, the terminal the so-called terminal experiments and whatnot that were conducted by uh, by Nazi researchers, and you know, a lot of that had to do with uh, human tolerances. You know, human tolerance, mm-hmm. various forms of torture and pain, and just how far you could push a person um, in various ways uh, before they died. You know, as far as sleep deprivation and food deprivation and, and you know, sensory overload and all, all of these different heinous things that they did to see how long the people could endure it before they actually died. And, of course, I mean, all of that research has, has applications both in mind control and in uh, interrogations, um, in both cases of which you want to, you know, torture your victim as close as you can to the point of death without actually killing them, because if you kill them, then you've lost your your subject, you know, or, you've, or your source of information. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that they do indeed have all of that information and, and that it's utilized in, in various unsavory ways, but I'm not familiar um, specifically with the, with the line of research that she was uh, discussing or, you know, uh, or the, uh, you know, technicalities of, of uh, you know, music containing, uh, you know, so pro- cool. rhythms or... or or you know backwards uh, mass uh, instructions or, or anything like that. It's a little beyond my level of expertise. No, and, and none of us really know. And, I'll, and actually, I would say that um, they're ahead of the curve. Only that um, they've heard other, uh, I guess, uh, individuals just who spoke to that. That is not necessarily where you were going. That might be indeed where you wind up. But. Um, um, and yeah, I don't want to jump you with that, but there seems to be something going on, and yet none of us really know, and nobody's really come out to say, look, you know, what's going on here is definitely a trigger. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, what's this guy, Augustus, uh, the big acid guru of the 60s up in San Francisco that had all the military and intelligence connections, and it served as an intelligence officer, and his, his family history contained, like, all these, you know, high-ranking officials and whatnot. Uh, Augustus uh, Stanley was that Owsley? Owsley. Okay. Yep. Yeah. He he was uh, didn't he? He started out, I, I believe, as the Grateful Dead's uh, sound technician. You know, he was the one that sort That's of right. That's right. That's right. Sort of. Sort of shaped their sound, and he had a background in you know psychological warfare and intelligence operations, and then he became the you know the big uh, acid producer and distributor that that uh, showed up routinely at uh, all the big rock festivals and handed out you know like you know massive <laughs> quantities of free free drugs to people. And yeah, so he started out as a, and there were other, as I recall from Martin Lee's book, Acid Dreams, I, I believe there were other people that were involved as sound technicians for some of these various bands that had like these intelligence uh, connections. So 
you know, it is quite possible that they, that they were tailoring a specific sound, you know, or a specific pattern of sounds or specific rhythms or, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, again, I, I just don't have the technical knowledge to to really address that in, in any sort of, you know, scientific way. No, and you need not. But it'll be interesting as you go, uh, you know, through your research, whether that'll come up, and not even if you want to delve in that, but if you actually, you know, that, that does ding up more or less where uh, uh, where your research leads you. Um, I think we can admit, though, uh, David, and we're running, you know, about three minutes left to go, that certainly this didn't happen on itself, did it? I mean, you know, I, I can't speak for music during the 30s and the 40s and what they were hoping to get out of that, but I would, but I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, perhaps 60s and 70s music probably had some kind of, hmm, embedded edge that music before did not have. What's your thoughts on that? Well, it certainly was a revolutionary new sound. I mean, it didn't sound like anything that it, that had come along before. It was, you know, it wasn't like a continuation of what had previously been considered, you know, rock music, you know, as in the, you know, Elvis Presley, Everly Brothers kind of mold, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a completely new and different sound, and it was a completely diff- new and different look that the, that the, the, the hippies and flower children had, and, you know, the, this, this, uh, simultaneous mass infusion of drugs, you know, into the counterculture, just, uh, there was a lot of things that, that were completely, you know, new and different that all sort of came together all at the same time, which is, you know, very odd, you know, that, <laughs> to my mind, that, that all of these, these, uh, elements would just sort of spring up, you know, si- simultaneously all at the same time, and, and across, you know, pretty much across the country. At a time like, you know, as we were discussing earlier, we weren't sort of all plugged into this sort of mass consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you this. If you were to look at one group that you felt probably had the most influence in, in, in politically affecting rock and roll listeners' um, minds, what, what group would you think? Top of, off the top of your head. I guess it would probably be the Beatles, although I, I, you know, I haven't really looked into the whole British invasion angle, so I can't, you know, I don't really know much about them, but, uh, I would say probably the Beatles, you know, and specifically John Lennon. Yes. And and that would bring us also to another very interesting situation with what or happened. Or maybe Bob Dylan. I don't. But no, probably the Beatles. But go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's just that. Well, we're going to pick this up because we're out of time. But I mean, you look at what happened to uh, Lennon. Is that also a coincidence? Listen. Uh, thanks, Dave McCown, for being with us, folks. You can go uh, to his website. And you'll see the link on my site, and you can plug in to see what's going on here. Dave, thanks a lot for being with us, and we'll no talk problem. in the near future, bro. Uh, mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. I mean, there'll be uh, many more parts going up, and uh, if you see something you want to talk about, I'll be more than happy to come back. Remember those words. We'll be back. Thank you very much, Dave. All right, thanks. All right, bye-bye.